Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Maybe you would say, what in the world are you going way back to the Old Testament for a message today which has to do with our country? Well, in Psalm chapter number 32, you know, the Lord has said plainly, and excuse, excuse me, Psalm 33 verse 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now that applied to God's nation of Israel, and it applies to every nation ever born. And so here in chapter 8, God gives the conditions to Israel for his blessing them. And if they don't follow this, how God will have to turn them and judge them. We'll just read some of the verses here in Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Let's begin down in verse number 7. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at the latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it's he that giveth thee power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant which he sware unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyed before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. That's a good passage for today. Absolutely, it's true what this passage says. Beginning in verse 7, it's the Lord that established this country. I read a comment there by Benjamin Franklin earlier. And of course, he acknowledged that. How could we have ever become a nation if it wasn't for the hand of God? Absolutely, Great Britain was the greatest power on earth at that time. They had an empire that was stated the sun never sets on British soil. They owned so much land around the world. But against that great power, God gave us victory because he wanted this nation to be established. And we honored him and praised him. And we had that first Thanksgiving, George Washington declared to thank God for all that he had done in our country. And it's because of his blessings that are listed here in verse 7 through 10. But things change. Verse 10 said, When thou hast eaten and art full, thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. We need to always acknowledge God even in our great prosperity. Beware, verse 11 says, that you don't forget the Lord. How do you forget the Lord? Well, isn't it sad to see as you come down through here, verse 14 says, Your heart be lifted up, thou forget the Lord thy God. And what do people say in verse 17? My power 
the might of my hand hath got me this wealth, they totally forget God. And we're about that way in the United States of America. Because men today preach humanism. Man does everything. Man is responsible for conquering his universe. Man is the one that makes all the decisions, even decides morality. Man, man, man. We've forgotten God greatly in our country. This passage is so much like that. And all oh, the worry would come as God warned Israel, you'll perish if you forget me. Your nation is going to end if you forget me. And of course, here's warnings way back before they even became a nation. Deuteronomy 8 was when they were still in the wilderness. Of course, they had many great years when they conquered the land. Remember the Lord as they had kings to begin with, but then forgot him. What a mess. The nation of Israel, eventually, they absolutely perished being a nation. 586, the last time, 586 we see that Israel was a nation until 1948. And so folks, we <coughs> add all of that together in nearly 2,000 years of no nation of Israel. Sad. But the Lord has predicted in his word they would be a future nation again. We've been able in our lifetime to see that. They're going to have great blessings yet in the future and a kingdom age. But I read this passage just to admonish us today. Let's ask God to bless us as I give you a few thoughts here today. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of honoring you and our country here today. Great hymns we've sung. They're old hymns, but my, how they have such rich meaning in praising you for our land and what you blessed us with and guided us and directed us. We thank you for the thoughts in all of these hymns we have sung today. Lord, we thank you for our great country and the great founding and how you blessed us abundantly. And as Alexis de Tocqueville said, the real secret of America is when he went to all the churches and saw what was preached and saw how America is great because she's good. She follows God and his laws. Oh, Lord, that we remember that today. But sadly, we're getting away from churches, getting away, and even in churches, preaching and teaching your word is not going on in many churches. Things are changing tremendously. And it's sad to see it today. And Lord, we've got to pray for our country, be concerned about it. So bless today as we consider some principles that made America great. And Lord, certainly pray they'll come back and we stand upon them in this country so you can bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Years ago in our country, there was an organization called the Moral Majority. Some that are older might remember the Moral Majority. It was headed up by Jerry Falwell, who was pastor of Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. He went around the country speaking a lot. I've heard him preach myself on a couple of occasions. And uh, Jerry Falwell came up with these things, seven principles that made America great. Now I decided just to give those to you today because they're so true. Seven principles our country stood for in the beginning should stand for today to continue the greatness that we have. So let me give you those today and think about what God says in his word. Principle number one. The principle of the dignity of human life. Exodus chapter 20 verse 13, one of the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not kill. In the New Testament, Jesus enlarged upon that in his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 21 and 23. And he says the thing that leads to murder you shouldn't have in your heart, and that's hatred towards someone. Hatred, as far as God's concerned, is just the same as murder as far as God sees that sin. Absolutely sad. It's important to see God is for life. And we certainly in this country started with a great uh, regard for human life. Not so in many other countries. You realize when the communists took over in Russia, 
Stalin in particular killed, they estimate, between 35 and 45 million of his own people. Joseph Stalin. When the communists took over China in 1949, in the course of the next 40 years, it's estimated they killed somewhere between 34 and 64 million Chinese people when the communists ruled that country. They had no regard for human life. We haven't had such purges in our country, amen? Praise the Lord for that because we've been founded on the importance of a life. Each individual life is important in this country. However, there is one area of human life that is certainly fallen by the boards. That's the life of unborn children. We've talked before about the fact that Psalm 139 and other passages, the Bible is plain. When a child is conceived, they become a human being. God has them recorded in heaven, it even says, before they're ever born. In his book in heaven, book of life, he's got them written there. How sad when men snuff, snuff out that life. And of course, since 1973, the Roe versus Wade case, over 55 million unborn children have been aborted in the United States of America. It's sad to see this. It's less than a million a year right now, thankfully. I think last year I saw a statistic, it was only about 800,000. Still unbelievable amounts of children to be aborted. Those are lies. Those 55 million are in heaven. We'll see them in the future. But certainly it's sad to see what our country's doing, losing that dignity of life. Second principle he mentions is the principle of a traditional monogamous family. God is the author of the home. He started it in Genesis chapter 2 with saying that man should not be alone. So he created a woman for that man, and we know that woman's name was Eve. And God said this in Genesis chapter number 2 and verse number 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. There's marriage as God established it. Now man in his humanism, I talked about a few minutes a few minutes ago, says no, we want to do what we want to do. We don't want to follow God's law of one man, one woman in holy matrimony. So in our country today, there's over 10 million couples, 20 million people that live together outside of marriage. They don't want to get married, they just want to live together. And that's just fine in the world's eyes of our day and age. Absolutely increasing all the time is this type of thing. Secondly, we now have same-sex marriage in our country, as you know. Of course, man and man, women and women getting married, and that's approved by the government. And people say, oh, that's just fine, it's okay. Again, following humanism, not what God says in his word. It's fallen. Truth. As Isaiah said, sad in our country, truth has fallen into the streets. People trotted underfoot. You know what they did in the streets years ago? They didn't out of their houses and their trash. Their trash, at the time that was said, truth has fallen the street. And Isaiah, they threw their trash into the streets. So when it's talking about taking the truth and throwing it into the street, it's like the truth is trash. People don't want it anymore. They want their weddings. You say, why does God allow this to go on? One word. God's marvelous grace. God absolutely is not through with what he's doing in this world today. And you know what? There's still people to be saved. And praise God, people continue to be saved around the world. Thank the Lord for that. He's not saved the last person yet. When the last person gets saved, then things are going to change. As the Lord Jesus comes back and calls his saints home to be with him. But our country was blessed because we believe in the right kind of monogamous family for many years. We are getting away from that big time. 
Third principle is the principle of common decency. Certainly, decency in our world ought to be there in what people say and how people act. Certainly, years ago, you would hear people publicly cursing and swearing and using dirty language and saying things like that. But it seems like everybody's got to do that anymore when they give speeches or on the airwaves or on television. It's just constant to see those things. We've got a lack of decency compared to what it used to be in our United States. Even when I grew up, I mean, we had some of the first TVs. My uh, grandparents, the Addisons and Danville, had one of the first televisions in Danville, Illinois. It's a huge, big box TV. And uh, had a little, I don't know, this isn't a big box, but just a little TV on top of it. And of course, you had to wait until it warmed up to come on. When you turn it off, they just gradually go off, have a little circle down in the middle, you know. Then it would disappear all together. <laughs> I remember that's the first TV I ever watched. My parents didn't have a TV until I was about, I think, six years old or so, 1958 or 59, somewhere in there we had a television. And as a little tiny, just a little black and white TV, that's what we had, you know. But you never heard cursing, swearing. And the other part of decency is how people look. You know, I don't like to see summer come on, I'll just tell you, because people want to take their clothes off and walk around practically naked. When Adam and Eve sinned, they discovered they were naked and tried to clothe themselves with coats of, of the fig leaves. God said, that's not sufficient. So he killed animals, the birth of death in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, and clothed them, and the Bible word for clothe there means completely, all from their head to their feet, clothe them in coats, coats of skin. Of course, today people say, hey, nobody cares, take all your clothes off and walk around that way and look at naked people on TV and naked beaches now in our country are found in Florida and California nude beaches. It's unbelievable. Common decency has fallen out the door. Our country was found on people. People like to dress up anymore. I mean, people want to just absolutely wear practically nothing and come to church that way. Some people come to church sometimes and I can't believe the way they walk into the house of God. You know, when the priests had ministered in the temple, and they realized by the temple and they was the church, but they were to cover themselves with their feet. They couldn't even let any skin be seen at all ministering in the temple. That was God's call. So I ask you, how do you think God looks at the way we dress? Is it important to him? think so. 1 Timothy chapter 2 even says, people ought to dress in modest apparel. That which becomes godliness. Read that passage. God's got something to say about it. Anyway, common decency was a principle our country was founded on. It's going by the boards today. Fourthly, he said the principle of the work ethic. Remember Genesis 3.19, God told Adam, now that you've sinned, you're going to work by the sweat of your brow. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to work long. Thorns and thistles you're going to have to deal with as he planted food and tried to grow it and so on. It was going to be hard work. And of course, that principle carries right into the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians 3.10, where the Bible says, if any man doesn't work, neither should he eat. God believes people ought to work. And of course today, people certainly like to get out of work. They like to be given things. I was amazed to hear that 47% of Americans, all that, receive something from the government. Receive something from the government. It's amazing. People want to receive, receive, receive. And that's why the lottery is working all 50 states. People don't want to work. We're going to get a million out of the lottery and I can retire and live it up. All their life wants to amount to is pleasure and having fun. 
wild sex equal all the work. The pilgrims, when they arrived here, tried to get everybody to go to have a common store. What that meant was they started out having everybody grow some crops and put it into a common store, and everybody took out equally for their food. But they discovered something. Some people didn't want to work as hard as others. The people that worked real hard and put more in the common store saw these people that lazy around didn't work very hard and only put a little bit in there. They were getting the same as the people that worked hard. So the people that worked hard said, I don't want to work hard anymore. Why should I? These people are getting everything just like they did. I don't want to work. It ruined their colony. Governor Bradford, I quote from before, said, no, this isn't going to work. Everybody's going to uh, grow your own crops and get what you grow yourself. You're going to have to live off what you do, and it made everybody work. The principle of the work ethic, but so many want to get out of that today. It's an important one to see. Fifthly, the principle of the Abrahamic covenant. Say, so what in the world is that? But way back in Genesis 12, whenever God told Abraham to leave the city of Ur and go to a place he would show him of, and he said in chapter 12, I'll make of you a great nation. People that bless thee will be blessed. People that curse thee will be cursed. In other words, the treatment of God's people is an important thing for God to bless a nation. <coughs> And we're talking about the treatment of the Jews. In the history of our country, we have certainly been friends of the Jews. In fact, the largest number of Jews for many years was in the United States of America. We have a lot here. Now, of course, Israel is finally, because of all the immigration in their country, they have more Jews in their country now than the United States of America has, but they're still many Jews here. And God has blessed our nation because we have certainly treated them properly. But sometimes you worry in our day and time. When you listen to some people that even say in our country, they should not have a nation over there. Give it all back to the Arabs. They're the ones that were there first. That's not true. If you go back in history, Israel certainly had their land before any Arabs were there. Nonetheless, if we cease to have the treatment of the Jews that we have in the past, we could be in trouble in the United States of America. God's promises are true. When he says the way you're going to be blessed, that's the way you're going to be blessed. You don't follow God, you'll find out. His blessings are withdrawn from you. Jerry Paul said six. There's the principle of God-centered education. For over 150 years of our country's history, the public schools, which were established in 1834 by Horace Mann, had as part of their curriculum Bible classes. Children learned memory verses, read the Bible, prayed, every single day in classrooms. And that went on through the history of our country right into the 1900s, right up to the time that we get to 1950s and so on, and then people begin to change. Finally, we have the atheists coming into existence and prominence in our country, the very start of humanistic ideas. They say the Bible shouldn't be a public education. Separation of church and state. That is totally taken the wrong way today. Nobody from the time the Constitution was written, which that statement is not in the Constitution, separation of church and state. It's not there. The First Amendment only means has there the freedom of it's not there either. The freedom of, of religion. We have the right to worship God the way you want freedom of religion. The separation of church and state is nowhere in the Constitution or the amendments. You know where it is? It's in a document that Thomas Jefferson wrote, where he was talking about the way things should be in our country. 
This is after the Constitution, after the amendments. Thomas Jefferson said there should be a wall of separation between church and state. But what he meant was, and what is being taken as that today are two different things. He meant that there should not be a state church. That was the problem of England that we were part of until we separated and had the independence. England had a state church, the Anglican church. They still do today. Do you know when we were over in England, the people that we stayed with over there years ago told us part of their tax pays the salaries of the Anglican church. Taxes go to the church. State churches, that's the way it works. In our country, our founders didn't want that. They didn't want to favor one church over another church. So definitely they wanted a separation of church and state. But that did not mean they didn't want to talk about God and pray to God and have his help for the government. They realized the government was established by God too. So when you find Thomas Jefferson writing things like that, did he say then, well, we're not going to talk about God anymore in government? No. He talks about God in government, the importance of God in government, and so do the presidents after him. It just came to the point where people came to misunderstand that and listen again to humanists. You try to tell us what it means, and it doesn't mean that obviously, that we don't have anything to do with God in government. So you've got to take anything to do with God out of public places, and to them that means even schools. So you know, in the early 60s, when I went to Oakland High School over here, we had Bible classes. But whenever they passed the Supreme Court that you couldn't have the Bible reading in the school anymore, couldn't have prayer in school anymore, the time I got to uh, through high school, it was over. Didn't have it there anymore because they ruled against it. And from that time to this, that's the way the public school system is, and now it's totally run by humanistic philosophy. You can't refer to God or have anything to do with God in your classroom whatsoever. That's the way it is in the public arena. I should say our God, the Christian God, because they do talk about Muhammad. In California, you have curriculum to show kids how they need to understand Things about Muslims. Now, why do they do that for Muslims and you can't do it for Christians? Do you think there's a concerted effort against Christianity in this country? You better believe it. Guess who's behind that? The devil. Who's growing in his power? We are getting so close to that tribulation time when he and his man, the Antichrist, are going to have control of it all. Try to be a Christian in that time, praise God, we'll be gone because the rapture. But to try and be a Christian will cost you your life. Read it in Revelation 13. It's going to be tough. But nonetheless, Christian schools rose up because of the way public schools uh, uh, came about. And uh, I had the privilege of going to one of the first Christian schools in the entire country, the United States, Tennessee Temple Grammar School in Chattanooga, Tennessee in the 50s. They started a Christian school there, and I got a good education there through the fourth grade. And uh, we left Chattanooga and went to Chicago, where my dad took his first pastorate. And I went back in the public school system in Chicago. Talk about a change to go from that Christian school to public school in Chicago, Chicago Heights, Illinois. It was a big, big change. But nonetheless, uh, Christian schools arose because Christians said, wait, we need to be sure our children are taught of the Lord. Isaiah tells us that, you know, in Isaiah 53, 14, all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. But when you forget about teaching about the Lord, oh, what a mess you might so nonetheless, we saw the principle of God-centered education in this country, but we've gotten away from it. So it's certainly sad to see that principle going by the boards too. Finally, Jerry Ball will mention the last principle, the principle of divinely ordained establishments. Realizing God was the author of the home, we need to follow his instructions. God was the author of government, started back in Genesis chapter number 9 and 10. God started it. And as a result of that, government should follow the laws of God. 
and churches are divinely established by God. Jesus himself said, I will build my church in Matthew 16, 18. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Those divine institutions we've long recognized in our country, but sadly, it's going. And we're not recognizing God in any of those three things today. That's very sad because those are the three institutions he's ever set up in this world. Three. God wants to be on the home, the government, the church. The humanism says no. No God in any of them. Let's be devoid of him. And we're going down the wrong path. So you might say today, well, Pastor, what in the world should we do? Well, it starts on an individual level. Start with yourself. Don't let the humanists take over your heart and mind about things. You still stand for the truth of God's word in the home, in government, and in the church. Stand for what's right. Live for righteousness. Then pray for our country. There's still power in prayer. Who knows what God might do? People were pretty amazed when uh, the present president was elected. They never expected to happen. In shock of shocks, after election night's over, we have a president that wasn't predicted to be president. So you never know what God can do. You need to understand that he's on the throne. And he has sent revivals in the past. It certainly doesn't seem like that might happen. You know, one man said, I've heard him speak this way, he said, you know, when most people in America go to church, when there's been wars, they're worried. Church attendance in World War I and World War II just went, shh. People were really concerned about what was going to happen. And I remember the Gulf War when I passed through this church in 1991 and 1992. Boy, a lot of people fought the church because we weren't really sure what might happen over there with Iraq when we went in. They had a lot of firepower and were said to be the fourth largest army in the world, fourth powerful nation in the world. What was said about Iraq when that started the Gulf War? So people fought the church. People here said, let's have special prayer meetings. But they were well attended, praying for our troops and what was happening over there. So somebody said, maybe we need another big war to bring America back to her knees and back to God. Well, I don't want to say that as such, but we ought to pray for our country. We ought to stand for righteousness. We ought to promote those who want righteousness in our country. Do what we can. Certainly God wants us to do that. Um, I'm going to read you something in closing. Is the great American dream turning into a nightmare? This article is entitled. By the way, I thought this was interesting. You see today's paper yet? 13 million Americans have become addicted to the lottery. They are now starting recovery programs to get people out of being addicted to the lottery. Isn't that something? Here's something we go against what God says. We're going to start. It's going to be good for education, good for the government, it's going to be good for our country to have gambling going on everywhere. To lose our citizens to all the addiction. By the way, you legalize marijuana in Illinois. What do you think is going to happen next? So many drug addicts we have now has got to go to the hospital all over the place on that stuff. Think people are going to be wise and use it wisely? Uh -uh. They have in the past, what well, makes you think they're going to do it now? The dumbness of people, the dumbness of what goes on today in the morality area is just so sad. But anyway, back to this article. Is the great American dream turning into a nightmare? God has showered America with 243 years of blessing. As she's acknowledged the later creator, God has elevated us from infancy to a place of world leadership. He's allowed us to enjoy unprecedented wealth, freedom, and influence. America's led the world in medical and technological advancement for many years. 
the nation's pioneer in the states, pushed back the frontiers of science, given its citizens the world's greatest and highest standard of living. America has opened her arms to millions of immigrants and refugees, first from Europe, then from the Far East, now from Latin America. Well, they're not all legal from Latin America now, are they? Coming into our border is a big problem there. With grateful and humble hearts, Americans once honored the God who granted her blessings and freedoms. But slowly, almost imperceptibly, she began to attribute her blessings not to God, but to man and herself. There it is. Forgetting to acknowledge the power that hath made and preserved this nation, her citizens began to congratulate themselves on their own achievements, to celebrate man and what he is able to accomplish and relegate God to a back seat. The God of secular humanism has taken over all of our institutions. Wallowing in materialism, self-centeredness, and pride, many Americans decided that they really did not need God after all. Some are tampering with God's absolute standards, tolerating what never would have been tolerated in our society before. That which God says is never right could be sometimes right, depending on the situation. Courts that once legislated against immorality began to grant freedom to every man to do what's right in his own eyes. Lines of right and wrong are blurred. In time, all sorts of ungodly behavior become acceptable, even admired, such as the big gay pride day yesterday. Did you see that in the paper? All around the world, thousands and thousands marching. Unbelievable. What used to be unacceptable is admired today. Americans are no longer shocked. Our eyes have become accustomed to the dark. When God fades from a nation's conscience, one starts justifying all wrong things. For instance, God says thou shalt not kill. Americans have given murder a new name, pro-choice, and killed so many young people. Men try to camouflage other sin with new terminology. Drunkenness is now alcoholism, a social disease. Homosexuality is gay rights, an alternate lifestyle. Perversion, called pornography for many years, is adult entertainment. Immorality is now new morality. Cheating is abnormal social development. All these disorders and sins of the past have changed our life. Drug addiction and alcoholism are certainly in great proportions in this country. Suicide is the second largest killer of teenagers in our country. Photographic magazines bring in 50 million, more than, excuse me, pornographic, I'm reading this wrong, pornographic magazines that number more than 20 million a year and books crowd newsstands. Cassette, uh, Video stores now market the products of X-rated theaters. One of, one of every two marriages ends in divorce. Some 1.3 million unmarried couples have lived together. Now this is a little old in this. It's up to 10 million that live together now. America once legislated against those things that God said was wrong, but gradually began to tolerate them, accept them, openly condone them, and even promote what once was unthinkable. The perversion and degradation that once made us blush are now flaunted before our eyes, and it's just like everything's normal. A lot of it happened because many Americans just didn't care. Did you get that? Many Americans just didn't care. So we're living out the truth of God's Word given to a past generation. Going back to our text this morning, this author quotes it. And it shall be when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers to give thee great goodly cities which thou buildest not, houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyard and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord, and thou say in thine heart, My power and my might of my hand have gotten me this way. Well, on this patriotic Sunday, I'm thankful for America. America certainly needs our prayers. It needs righteous lives. 
both in spite of what society and the world says, absolutely stand for what God says. Stand for righteousness. You may be persecuted very soon. Pastors may be persecuted very soon. I talked to my son this week. He's down in Northport, uh, Florida, talking about some of this stuff because he's preaching on the same type of thing down there in his church today. But I said, you know what? You've got a lot of years to go if the Lord tarries. I can't imagine what it would be like to stand up and preach the Bible and God's righteousness in our country before very long. You're going to be persecuted. They already want to take away a lot of First Amendment rights of people, by the way, who believe in freedom of religion. They're talking about not making exemptions for churches about certain things. And Christian schools, our school's going to be in the middle of it, especially in our state right here, what takes away an exemption, whatever they decide on certain social issues, everybody's got to buy by it. Everybody's got to buy it. Whether it's right or wrong, you got to buy it by it. It's the way they want it to be. So pray for uh, uh, <laughs> Van de Bosch, forget his first name. Van de Bosch is a man who for 20 years has been in Springfield representing Christian schools in our, in our state. I appreciate the man. I need to have him here sometime to talk to you. It would be very interesting. But nonetheless, he said, dark days are really descending on Christian education in the state. It may be very hard to hold the stands we've stood for and keep the doors open very soon. And that's the way they want it. Because the humanists want the minds of everybody. They don't want anybody thinking differently than the way they want you to think. The way they want you to think, what you believe in our country, is where you want to have to be. That's where they feel about it. They're so intolerant of those who want to think differently and say something differently. So intolerant. Sad to see where we are. Pray for our country. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together today to consider our nation. And Lord, we thank you for America. We love America, as the choir sang. I would not want to be a part of any other country around this globe. I think it's a privilege to have been born in this great land and have had all the tremendous opportunities and blessings and freedoms that we enjoy here right at the present time. I thank you. Lord, our country's been great because, as Alexa Tocqueville said, we've been good. But, Lord, we're getting away from that goodness. We are totally changing what you say, and we're doing what we want to do, what man wants to do. His ideas are absolutely ideas that, that have to be followed, they say today. But they're not new ideas. All these things, they're legitimizing and and absolutely putting before us today as being okay, go way back even the Old Testament roots. And when we see gambling, what's going on there, and we see this uh, killing of unborn children, and we see the legalization of same-sex marriage, and all these things, it goes back to the Old Testament. There's nothing new under the sun. It's just now legitimizing all of these sins, and saying they're okay. Well, a man might say they're okay, you never say they're okay. We better remember it's appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. Who are we going to face, Lord, when we leave this life? Not all these humanistic people. They aren't going to be our judge. You're the judge. We need to follow you, obey you. And Lord, the best thing we can do for our country is live a righteous life ourselves. Lead our homes according to the Bible and pray for our country. Do what we can to spread the news of the gospel and of the right living and support those who are running for offices with the right stands, Lord. That's what we need to do. And I pray we can still see America change around. What a blessing that would be. Have your will and way in our hearts and lives this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's just stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I'm not going to have a usual.